Okay, let's try to get started with the uh, lecture. Uh, I think everything's working good. We have uh, an exam coming up a week from today, exam X. This is the special one. And just a few concepts to review with you uh, to get your thinking in the direction uh, that you should go uh, before getting here uh, next Tuesday. First of all, it's going to be covering a little bit more uh, material than a single midterm with me normally does. And it's, but it's about the size of a single midterm. So uh, that means that there's going to be a certain number of brain burners, uh, a little bit more challenging problems to make you think. Uh, but in proportion, there'll be more uh, questions covering the basics. And so hopefully it'll grade out easier uh, for most of you. Some of you may still uh, feel it's difficult uh, and there's a lot of variation, but uh, hopefully it'll, it'll grade out a little bit uh, more, uh, a little easier for you. Another thing I, I want to uh, mention to you uh, and you can jot this down uh, concerning formulas. We've had a few formulas. We'll talk about some today. We'll talk about some more on Thursday. And students always ask me, Dr. B, is there a formula sheet for the test? And the answer to that is N-O. Uh, no, no formula sheet. But what there is, is a set of three or four, four or five questions that are matching. Uh, and in the matching, you know, matching questions, you always have two columns. You know, you ma match one thing from the first column to one of the, you know, four or five items on the other column. And so what I normally do is I make the first four or five questions, you know, three or four or four or five, something like that, um, a formula or equation. And then in the other column, you know, with A, B, C, D, and E that you choose, like the name of the formula or, uh, you know, the definition or some kind of concept. You know, we use this to calculate mass of a binary star or some other uh, thing. And, and then you'll be able, so you'll have the equivalent of a formula sheet and always with the formulas that you'll need, either to think with or to actually calculate with. Uh, and then you'll have um, a, a concept of some kind to connect to it. So your task for formulas and equations is not to memorize. And I don't want you to memorize. What I want you to do is recognize. It's a little bit easier of a task. And you get one point. So it makes studying a little bit simpler in that you don't have to memorize stuff. Now, if you're the person that likes to memorize, and I know there's probably several of you in here that are, uh, God bless you because it's not going to help a whole lot, especially on the tougher questions. And everybody's going to know, uh, you know, just like how everybody knows the value of pi, 3.14, you know. And because you used it, you've used it a million times, you've seen it a million times. And you know your phone number, hopefully, because you've used it a million times. You don't sit around, okay, you've got to memorize this phone number. But you don't because you've used it all the time. So there, there will be stuff that you'll know um, as if you've memorized it, but I don't, I, I don't write my tests in, in this class or, or and actually any test uh, for memorization. Now, I know that some classes there are, like uh, anatomy or history or something like that. You get those flashcards going. You get a big old stack of them, and you rock those flashcards going into the test, and then you crush the test. You can do that in this class. It's not going to help a whole lot. All right? Maybe a little bit, but... You know, so don't, don't spend... So remember, with formulas, recognize. Don't memorize. And you'll re if you've been to class and you've worked on homework and studied, talked with your study partners and whatnot, uh, you'll be able to recognize them. It shouldn't be that hard. Although I might catch you napping, you know, depending on how well you study, so... Uh, Here's the things I want you to bring on Tuesday next week. Uh, bring yourself a raspberry colored Scantron. Uh, it has the Pegasus logo for UCF on it. And it has 50 questions on the front. 
and two columns, and then 50 on the back. Now we'll use for a midterm exam X, we'll use the front. And uh, on the final, we'll use both sides most likely. Uh, bring a regular number two pencil, the better, the, the, the you know, a good quality one. And a good eraser. Now, the eraser that I suggest is one of these pink rectangular jobs that you had like in third grade. Because they erase really good. And I have one myself up here in my pencil case. Uh, and so, uh, because I have found that on the, the pencils that you get these days, the eraser can really even um, tear, if you're trying to erase something on a Scantron, it can actually wear a hole in it, and that is what you don't want to do. All right. Bring yourself a calculator uh, like this one picture. This is a TI something, TI30X. Uh, buy one for 15 bucks over the bookstore or, or dash down to Walmart or something. Get one. Um, and just know how to use your square root key pretty much, and you should be all right. Uh, we won't have a huge amount of calculations, but we will have a few. And if you have to, if you can't, uh, if, you, if you forget your calculator and you don't have one on the test, you'll, you'll do your calculations on the test itself, um, you know, fifth grade, long division, etc. It won't take you a huge amount of time to do it that way either. So, uh, but what you do not want to have on you, uh, out on your desk or anything is your uh, cell phone, your smartphone. I know, I know they have nice calculators. I use mine all the time. But on uh, exams, no, you may not have it. All right? And we'll be going around the room um, checking. Okay? So just make sure you, you know, you, uh, you know, just like when you go to the movies, oh, you know, they, they say, okay, time to turn off your phones. So you turn off your phone, just put it in your knapsack or what, whatnot. And that'll be good. Now let me pause for questions concerning exam X. Yes. You can use a graphic calculator if you've got one. It's, you know, I mean, you know, I've never actually owned one of those because I've always had laptops and stuff. But yeah, you can, if you know how to use it, don't, and if you don't know how to use it, don't come up to the front because I don't know how to use those babies either. And, uh, but, um, yeah, so that, that'll be fine. Another question. Yes. Are we taking the exam in here? The question is, are we taking it in here? Uh, yes. Yes, it's going to be right here. So just report to class for 1.30 next Tuesday, just like you did today. And the, the one thing, and I'll just mention this to you, what we're going to do is cram everybody up in the first 10 rows or so. And the reason, and so you're going to be sitting hog by, what is that? Cheek by jowl uh, with your neighbor. All right. So everybody take a shower Tuesday before you come to school so that you don't smell up your, and because you're going to be sitting next to, you're going to be sitting uh, right next door to somebody in the first 10 rows or whatever we decide to use. And the reason that we do that is the following. Uh, we will count out sets of, I don't know, this looks like it's about 12 or 13 people. And what's your first name? Christian. Christian. Raise your hand, Christian. Christian's row up here. He's got the first big row. And it looks like about 12 or 13 seats. I'll make up a bundle of 12 or 13 exams for that row. And I'll hand it to Christian or whoever's sitting on the aisle. And then he'll take one from the top and pass it over. And that way we get the exams out really fast. And you have more time to actually write the test, read it, get all the questions down right. So, um, so we'll have special seating. And I'll, I'll, I'll be shepherding you up into the seats and stuff. But just get used to the idea of sitting. And if you have to have a left-handed... Our writing desk, make sure you um, snag one. All right. Question over here. The test period is 80 minutes from 1.30 until 2.50. Now, the faster you guys get in here, 
and in rows to where I don't have to say, all right, guys, come fill in these seats. If we have people seated solid all the way across in each row that's designated, uh, we might take five minutes to get started, and then I'll give you 75 minutes for a 50-question test, and that's going to be multi bene, all right? Uh, but if, you know, if people are, you know, especially if there's a lot of lay people, they're not going to get the full 75 minutes or, you know, however long. Usually the first one, it takes a little bit longer. But um, it, hopefully if, if everybody uh, organizes themselves, it should, should be about 75, 70 minutes. It's going to be plenty of time. Question? The question is, will you be using the clicker on the test? And my answer to that is uh, yes, no, maybe. I don't, I, I know it's, I haven't decided yet. But I'll, and I probably will not decide until I write the test over the weekend. But I will do this. I will post in web courses an announcement or something. And I'll be able to tell you maybe, maybe Friday or Saturday when I'm actually writing the test. Uh, okay, we're going to have four clicker questions. All right. And they're going to be uh, six points total. All right. And that means that we'll have, you know, six clicker questions means 44 regular Scantron dots. Okay. So, and that's the, so um, when we do have clicker questions, uh, they'll be the, so if I have four clicker questions, they'll be printed on a separate page at the end of the test. Four questions, and sometimes the clicker questions uh, have a little bit of a calculation to do. You know, like we did ellipticity, or excuse me, eccentricity uh, last Thursday. Wait a minute. Yeah, Thursday, Thursday. We did eccentricity. So if I give you one of those, that might be a two-point uh, calculation. Sometimes I give you one or two uh, multiple choice. And the reason that I do that, what is your name again? Yeah. Sophia, the reason I do that, Sophia, is that it's easy for me to look at your actual responses to each question. So if you, so like for instance, on a numeric question, if, um, if the answer is eccentricity 0 0.702 and you write 0 0.072 or 0 0.72, I'll know that you or or if you write 702 without the decimal point because the decimal point is hard to see sometimes I'll know yeah they you know th you know they you know had a fat finger error or something and I'll give them partial I I'll give the student um, partial credit now you can't do that on Scantron also I can analyze everybody's um, specific uh, answer and uh, and give it individual attention all 300 and something students in this section. Um, and you can't do that with, well, you can do it with Scantron, but it's a nightmare trying to get the Scantron data. So, uh, so it, it'll, it'll be like that. Now, if I decide we're not going to have any uh, clicker questions, then it'll all be 50 dots on the front of the test. All right. But I'll decide probably Friday or Saturday, and then I'll post, and then you'll know. All right. So, but be assume that there will be some clicker questions, and and then if they're not, then it'll be so much uh, simpler and stuff. All right. So I might. So and here's another thing. If I give you uh, six clicker questions, or if I give you, I could give you like three clicker questions for six points. A three-point calculation, a tough one, a brain burner, a two-point basic calculation. And then a one-point uh, multiple-choice question on clickers, and um, and that would be six points, but only three questions. Okay, so the other four. So you might have forty-four questions on the Scantron, and then three clicker questions. It just depends on how I assign the points. All right. Another question. Yes. SAS, uh, you'll be doing, if you're a student that's taking it with SAS, uh, no problems. You'll be writing your clicker questions on the test itself. So, uh, and then it'll be hand graded by Dr. B. All right, so everything works good that way.
and the scantrons will be the same as everybody else. Another question. All right, let's keep going. Uh, I think that's all I want to mention about the test. Uh, but we'll have time to, uh, you'll have question time on Thursday about the test too. So just to double check. All right, let's talk about uh, last week, Thursday, we talked about Kepler's three laws of planetary motion, specifically uh, number one, which was his uh, kind of discovery that Mars and all the planets are actually following elliptical orbits. And we talked about the fact that a planet will travel on an ellipse uh, that's not necessarily a circle. Now, all the planets are very close to perfect circles, but uh, Kepler discerned in the orbit of Mars, uh, yeah, that it actually is an ellipse, slightly oblong, uh, and not a perfect circle. The sun is not at the center where the major and the minor axis intersect, but it's off to the side at the focus, one of the focus points. Uh, and then the other focus is empty, and that's diagrammed out on this, um, uh, this diagram. Uh, that other point, the empty focus uh, you may think, Dr. B, is, does that mean that there's like an alien planet or an alien star that nobody can see? Or, or what is the meaning of that? And the answer is, it's just an artifact of the geometry of ellipses. And Mother Nature arranges her planets uh, just using the, the one focus. It does, Mother Nature doesn't need uh, two. And it just it has one. The other one's just kind of out there uh, like a milestone, but it doesn't have any physical significance uh, so far as we know. We calculated the ellipticity, uh, which is a numeric way of rating the oblongness. If, if B, the semi-minor axis, and A, the semi-major axis are different numbers, if B is smaller than A, then this ratio, a squared over b squared, will be less than 1, and then 1 minus that will be less than 1, and then the square root of that will be the eccentricity, and we calculated some. And actually, I'll be talking about eccentricity again today uh, because it relates to uh, New, uh, Kepler's second law and the third law as well. It's, it's a pretty important figure. We had some uh, vocabulary terms, aphelion, the point farthest from the sun, perihelion, the point uh, nearest to the sun on that object's orbit. I mentioned that highly elliptic orbits like this one are more typical of comets than of planets. Our planets are almost perfectly round. But there are many, many comets that have a highly elliptical orbit. And so they're really moving fast down at perihelion. We put spacecraft into Earth orbit, and then this, those special points are called perigee and apogee, uh, referring to G-E-E, -E, uh, G, G-O, Earth. All right, so the farthest point from Earth, apogee, and perigee, the, the closest point. And there's a lot of military satellites and other satellites uh, that are uh, parked in orbit that are elliptical. Most uh, communication satellites are circular, as circular as they can make them. And they have thrusters to adjust their position a little bit in orbit and stuff so that they're just right. Uh, but, you know, we, we use all kinds of elliptic orbits. This, and, you know, like the space shuttle and the Hubble Space Telescope stuff are fairly circular, but not perfectly circular. They have a little bit of ellipticity, a little bit of eccentricity to them. Now, the other two laws are the equal area law, number equal areas, plural, law, number two, his second law, and then the big one, the third law, that relates orbital period in the same on major axis. And that's the law that we're going to really think and talk about today. But before we do that, let me bring to your attention uh, one more figure, figure three, 
from the textbook. Uh, but before we do that, we have a question from the eye. What? Focus? Uh, yeah, Let, let's look at this figure. If you draw, your homework is going to give you a YouTube about how to draw an ellipse with pencil and paper and string and a couple thumbtacks on a bulletin board or something. You'll see it on YouTube. The two thumbtacks that are used left and right here, and you loop the string around the two thumbtacks, uh, those two thumbtacks are the focus points, the foci, all right? And so f geometrically speaking, those are the two, uh, what is your name again? Christian? Okay, Christian, those are two Christians on the aisle here, very good. Just a good start. Okay. Uh, those two, you, you, can, you can set up any, any ellipse by, you know, choosing two points, putting in the thumbtacks, and getting a length of string, and drawing on the ellipse. And, and the YouTube that you're going to look at for homework tonight will show you how to do that. And, you know, the same two thumbtacks, same distance apart, might give you um, a different ellipse if you choose a longer string. All right? to loop around the two thumbtacks. So there's a lot of variations, uh, but that's what the focus is. Right? It's a special point in the geometric construction using line segments and everything for every specific point on the um, ellipse. All right? And so this is figure three. It shows you how to do that. You'll have a YouTube to look at tonight. Kind of cool. And, and actually, uh, there's about a zillion YouTubes of people drawing ellipses with this method. And I thought it was pretty cool the first time I did it, and so you might like to do it. Astound your, astound your friends and confound your enemies by drawing ellipses. All right, clicker question. Go ahead and turn your clicker on. And we're on frequency DD. So if you're using, um, where are you now? Uh, the gent with the clicker for the first time. Uh, yeah. Uh, hit the power button, hold it down until it flashes, and then DD, and then did you get Go Nitro? Good. All right. uh, but I still want you to go and see if you can exchange it. See if you can exchange it after class and get a different one. All right. All right. Now, this is a visual IQ test. I want you to answer to the best... Um, of your visual ability. Make a decision. I'll grade every answer correctly. So just give me your best opinion. There's four options. Select your answer and then hit the send key. I see one guy putting his hand up looking at the, you know, you know, that's good. Which orbit below is a perfect circle? Orbit 88? or orbit K, or both of them, or neither of them. Just use your eyes. And you know, I'm asking you to use your eyes to decide, and guess what? That's what Kepler did. He was using his eyes, and there is an answer here. A specific answer. Uh, let me give you another 15 seconds. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All right, good. 200 of you. All right. Oh, oh. Check this out. Before I show the answer, here's the distribution. Look at that. Uh, no majority. So what this tells, tells me is you guys are all making a call, and there's a lot of difference of opinion. All right? And that's kosher. And that is why I, I knew that it wasn't a clear-cut case. And that is why I'm giving everybody um, correct on this problem. Now, 27, let's see, which one was the, 
The most popular was D. Uh, neither of them is a perfect circle. Hmm. Well, let's, let's see which is the correct answer here. More people voted for D, but you know what? It's A. Who voted for A? Raise your hand. Genius. Genius time. Uh, yeah, or either that or luck. <laughs> but anyways, yeah, uh, orbit 88. Now let's take a look at this. Uh, orbit K is actually the one that Kepler, it's K for Kepler, this is the one that he spotted as an ellipse for Mars. So let's take a look at these babies. All right, now the yellow one is orbit 88. Um, and what I'm going to do is align a perfect square. Orbit 88 is a perfect circle by design. You know, with my software, I made a perfect circle. And now I'm going to align a perfect square around it, and you'll see that there's no daylight. All right? So there's no daylight there. Now, Kepler's Mars orbit, orbit K, we're going to try to do the same thing, but there's going to be a little bit of daylight. If you have eagle eyes, you'll see it. And it's not easy to see. See it? Right down there, just a little bit. But by God, Kepler saw that. Can you believe it? <laughs> that guy is a, I tell you what, boy, talk about eagle eyes to the nth degree. He did it. He knocked it. Anyway, so Kepler bagged it, um, and, but, but guess what? Um, most of the planet, uh, Mars is the most elliptical. Um, it's very elliptical, and uh, oops. I accidentally started another question. Um, Mars is very, very elliptical. Everything else is even closer to a perfect. Earth is way closer. You know, Earth has got a very small eccentricity. And actually, we'll take a look at it in a second. All right, but first, let's take a look at the second law. Now, this is the one that Kepler worked out as well. It involves the area that is swept out, you know, by the, the radius that goes from the sun out to the planet you know, in equal time. So 30 days over here in this, uh, let me get my cursor. Come on, cursor. Uh, 30 days over here in this slivery one marked A. And this is a diagram from figure four from your book. Uh, and versus uh, more of an almost 90 degree size wedge, but not as, not as wide. Uh, for um, segment B, another 30-day period, or whatever the period of time is. And so Kepler found out that if you do that, the areas are the same. Those two wedges, even though they have different shapes. And my wonderful students, this is not an easy problem to do. I have no idea how Ke Kepler figured it out, but he figured it out. Now, the reason for it is that gravity's strength changes as the planet is closer or farther from the sun, right? So to perihelion, it is really moving fast because gravity is stronger near the sun. Aphelion, it's way out there, you know, way out there past Neptune or wherever, you know, the aphelion point is, and gravity's a lot weaker out there. So gravity's bringing it back in. It'll loop back around on the orbit, but it's kind of slow when it's going out there by aphelion. All right, so make a note of that. Gravity's strength, the change in gravity with distance, and we'll take an explicit look at that on Thursday. You'll have studying. You're still, by the way, there's homework four uh, running. I published it uh, just before class started. And also homework three, you should finish that reading if you haven't already done that. Um, now, let's take a look at, a little bit closer look at it. Okay, here's the fastest point 
out here, all right? Perihelion, where it's closest. And here's the slowest point over here, aphelion, where it's furthest away, right? As I just mentioned. Now, between the, you know, so go ahead and mark down perihelion, fastest, or maximum speed. Now, the speedometer reaches its biggest number at perihelion. Aphelion, slowest or minimum speed. It's still moving, but it's not as fast as at perihelion. Question all the way in the back. Repeat. Homework list. Look at the homework list. It's in there, my friend. Just click on the... It's right down there below the picture of the uh, observatories. Anyway, so the perihelion and the aphelion. Now, in between fastest speeds, maximum speed at perihelion, and minimum speed at aphelion, you have intermediate values. Right, so go ahead and put a dot down here uh, somewhere in the lower half. Uh, I've got mine right here. All right. And just mark down medium speed. And if, and if you were an astronomer and tracked it for a few days, you'd be able to say, oh, well, that's about 22.9 kilometers per second or whatever the speed is. And it would be something a little bit slower than the speed down here at perihelion. And something a little bit faster than uh, out here at aphelion. All right. Now, on, in this orbit, it's going, look at it, put an arrow in here. This one's got an arrow right down here. All right. So there's your arrow. This one's going uh, counterclockwise, right? Okay. So this is like looking, and it's a comet orbit. It's not a planet. It's... You know, there's zillions of comets that have this much eccentricity. Okay, it's going counterclockwise. So now, look. On the, the bottom half of its orbit, make a note, it's slowing down. Because it's going from maximum to aphelion. Where's my... Come on, come on. Where's my... There we go. It's going from perihelion maximum to aphelion slowest. So it's slowing down on the bottom half of this orbit. Now up here, you can put another dot up here if you like, another intermediate point. Now it's speeding up It's because get, it's getting closer to the sun. This is what we call a closed orbit. All right, now there are things called open orbits or unbound orbits. And those take a different geometric shape that we'll talk about on Thursday. And those are the orbits that you would take if you were sending a spacecraft out of the solar system. You'd want it to take an unbound orbit. In other words, interacts. What they normally do is they, they send it close to Jupiter and slingshot it around Jupiter and get up some extra speed, enough speed to leave the solar system. And we've, we have several... Uh, spacecraft that are, are leaving the solar system already, like Voyager. The famous one is Voyager. It's been outside. It's, it's approaching the true outside of the solar system as we speak. And it's, it's, it's not on a closed orbit. It's on a, uh, an, uh, an unbound orbit now. All right, now, here are some numbers. I want you to jot down this table. We're going to talk about this medium speed between max and min. And... The, the picture, do not be deceived, the picture is for, for more like a comet. And Earth is, uh, but Earth actually is an ellipse. Its eccentricity is 0 0.0167. It's not zero. It's not a perfect circle, but it is pretty close. Now, because it's not a perfect circle, it has a variation between minimum speed and maximum speed. Right? So the... the the third line, V min in kilometers per second for Earth is about 29.29 kilometers per second. 
at its slowest, at aphelion. All right. Now, at perihelion, it's just a little bit faster. For Earth, it's about 3% variation between minimum and maximum speeds. 30.29. Now, we haven't got anything that goes that fast. Um, we, you know, some of our spacecraft we've got going pretty fast, but I don't think we've got anything going that fast. All right, and certainly no aircraft. All right, now here's another one, the moon. The moon's orbit, it has an ellipticity a little bit bigger. All right, it's about three times bigger, 0 0.0549. All right. And you can see, now the moon's orbit is not as fast as the Earth. The moon's orbit around the Earth is not so fast as the, um, <clears throat> as the Earth's orbit around the sun. So the first column of data there for the Earth, that's Earth orbiting the sun. Moon orbiting the Earth, that's the second column of data. Um, it's still going pretty fast. You know, we don't have any, we have a few airplanes that maybe get that fast. But you can see that at its minimum speed is 0 0.97 kilometers per second and maximum 1.082 kilometers per second. And that's about a 12% variation. All right. So bigger eccentricity, bigger percentage variation. All right. The entire orbit's a little bit slower, but the variation is a little bit bigger if you compute it on a basis of percentage. Okay, Mars. Uh, eccentricity 0 0.0935. And look at those speed variations. 21.97 kilometers per second. And 26.5 for maximum for, Ma for Mars. All right, now, Mars is slower than Earth. You know, the maximum speed for Mars is slower than the maximum speed for Earth. Matter of fact, the maximum speed for Mars is faster, is slower than the slowest speed for Earth, all right? Because Earth is closer. It's closer in, gravity stronger, a little bit faster orbit. And Mercury, I don't have the, fi the figures here, I just want to do these three objects. Mercury would be even faster because it's really close, all right? But you can see that there's a big variation from 21.97 minimum up to 26.5. Now, you may say to yourself, Dr. B, how big of a variation is that percentage-wise? 21%. So make a note of that. I didn't have room for that in my table, but you can jot it down. 21% variation for Mars between apogee speed and perigee, not apogee, aphelion speed and perihelion speed. Min speed and max speed. All right, and so um, so those intermediate points like this one down here is going to be somewhere, and and gravity smoothly changes that speed as it goes around the bottom half, slows it down. You know, so Earth would slow down to about twenty nine point two nine out at aphelion, and then gradually ease back in to about 30.29 at perihelion, all right? Question uh, back here, yeah, go ahead. Perihelion is the closest point on the orbit to the sun, helios. Perigee is the point for something that's <laughs> orbiting Earth, the point closest to Earth, G, G-E-O. Aphelion, Apo away, Helios away from the sun. It's the furthest point on the orbit. That's what I've got mapped out here. Uh, Apog is for something that's not orbiting the sun, but orbiting Earth. Okay, so you know you listen to those guys on the NASA channel, and they, sometimes you'll hear you know some spacecraft approaching apogee, t minus five point zero seven seconds or something like that. And so that's what. The, so it's the furthest point. Apo anything, you know, Apo X means the furthest point. Peri X means closest to the object that's being orbited. Now let's take another look. Here are the slivers again, the, the pie wedges. Um, and so this is, 
you know, this is some nominal, like a 30-day sweep. And supposedly, those two areas, kind of shaded in light blue, uh, are equal. To calculate that using calculus, it's fairly easy to calculate the, the area of a full ellipse. But these one, but to calculate um, a sliver uh, or a wedge for which the tip of the wedge is at the focus, not the center. Oh my goodness, very difficult. I would, I mean, it could be done, but I would not want to be the one that have to do it. They typically make physics grad students do calculations like that. It is not easy. Now, what would be easy is if you had something that was on a perfect circular orbit. And that's like the clock, you know, any clock, you know, it goes around 60 minutes per hour. You know, one, one minute every 60 seconds. All right. Uh, and so circular orbit will be like that, equal size pi wedges, you know. So 30 day wedge, 12 of them per year if it's the Earth. You know, Earth's pretty close to a circle. Uh, and so all the wedges, all the 30 day wedges for Earth will be just about the same size. And if it were a perfect circular orbit, exactly the same size. All right, any other questions about pi wedges and the second law? Yes, go ahead. Just a second. No, everything is affected the same way. You know what the difference is between an elliptical orbit and a circular orbit? How the orbit begins, the initial conditions, the initial velocity, and a comet, what happens with comets, they actually get budged. You know, there's a huge reservoir of comets orbiting the sun. It's called the Kuiper Belt. And every once in a while, one of them gets a nudge Actually, from Jupiter, you know, if Jupiter is at the right place, it'll nudge it just a, a millimeter or two um, inward, and that'll eventually send it all the way into the middle of the solar system. So it'll, it'll change from a circular to a highly elliptical orbit. So it gets a little bit of a velocity kick. And it's that velocity kick at the outset uh, that determines the shape and and. Uh, size of the elliptical orbit, but the circular orbits of the planets are circular, are pretty close to circular, most of them, because when the solar system formed, it was this big swirling disk, circular disk of, you know, smithereens of old exploded stars and stuff. And, if, and it was moving basic, kind of like, it looked like, you know, a swirling spiral galaxy, but just a miniaturized one you know, solar system size. And that was all circular. So, and, and a vestige of that is the asteroid belt. And the asteroid belt is leftovers from the beginning of the uh, solar system and still in a circular orbit. You know, and eventually most of that will be swept out by Jupiter and Saturn a little bit. Occasionally Mars or Earth will, will budge it, an asteroid and then you know, it'll, you know, like plunge into the sun or it'll get kicked out of the solar system completely. And, but yeah, those are leftovers from the beginning of the solar system. So it's the initial velocity that uh, uh, determines the shape. You had a question. Um, so like regarding the calculations, have you ever done these calculations? So have, have I ever done this calculation? No, I have not. And the reason for that is I have never wanted to. And in fact, I would run. <laughs> from having to do it. But I mean, it's, it's just big, hairy. In, uh, raise your hand if you've had calculus. Anybody? Okay, for those of you that have had calculus, it's like a three-dimensional integral with, uh, that you can't look up in the back of the calculus book. You've just got to grind it out. It's a lot of work. But I mean, dude, no. If, if I'm afraid of it, I'm not going to, that would be cruel. Yeah. I mean, I would have to, I would have to sue myself. <laughs> for just, just making sure. Yeah, no, you don't have to do, no. This one's a simple one, the third law. This is the big one. 
This is the best of the three. It's fairly simple. Um, the planets orbit the sun, elliptical paths, and the relationship between the orbital period, how long it takes to make one orbit, and the orbital size, the semi-major axis, is simply this. In the solar system, period squared equals semi-major axis to the third power. P squared equals A to the third. And that is exactly what Kepler found, and it still holds. If you measure the distance, if you're in the solar system, and you measure the distance, uh, or you measure the period in Earth years, so in other words, don't, you know, don't measure the, the period in seconds, don't measure it in days, use Earth years. And then for the semi-major axis, uh, measure it in terms of the astronomical unit. You know, the, now, so, so don't measure the semi-major axis in light seconds. We know that for Earth, the semi-major axis is about 500 light seconds. Okay, now Kepler used, Kepler saw the pattern using astronomical units as he had to, and also using years as he was permitted. To. I mean, he could have done seconds and days, seconds or days, or centuries for that matter, but it wouldn't have been as clear. But years and astronomical units, it all falls into place. Now, um, nowadays, if you're outside of the solar system, you, you have to use a form where you can't necessarily use astronomical units because you're not in the solar system. Okay, so if you use a bunch of uh, other units like light seconds or days, um, then there's a bunch of other constants uh, as Newton proved. And we'll talk some more about Newton's law of universal gravitation uh, on Thursday. Um, but we're going to look at the alternate version, the full version that Newton um, uh, figured out in just a second. Now, Here's another picture that I want you to look at. This one shows the average orbital speed, not max, not min, but average, on the vertical axis. And you can see that Earth's down here at about 30, which is what we had in that previous table. And Mars is down here in the 20s, you know, which is what we had in that table. And Saturn and Jupiter are getting... They're about 10 kilometers per second average, okay? So Jupiter's a little faster, uh, and Saturn's just a little bit below 10 kilometers. Now, here's what you want to remember. Those babies are still whipping, okay? They're still, you know, compared to Mercury, they're, they're kind of pokey, but compared to what we've got, this is the fastest we got. SR-71 Blackbird, the finest airplane on God's green earth of all the ones that we know about. <laughs> now, out there at Area 51, you know, with, with the aliens, you know, but the, you know, the ones that we're allowed to know about, SR-71, baby. Uh, you know how fast it goes? Maybe a kilometer a second. Nothing else goes faster than them. And that's maybe a kilometer. So that's still like 10 times slower than Saturn. All right. And the moon on its orbit is about, you saw at minimum speed 0.97, maximum speed 1.0 something. Right. So would that be cool or what? In the SR-71, flying along the same path as, as the moon's orbit? Excellent. You know, maybe I should write a science fiction novel for, you know, like the Transformers movie, you know, where the, you know, the, what's that? Yeah, but it's Hollywood, man. <laughs> you wouldn't have any atmosphere for jet engines, true, but, they, they, but it's Transformers, so they would transform into, you know, anyway, that would be kind of cool. So, so SR-71 is going about as fast as the moon goes. So uh, now here's the form. Go ahead and now jot this one down. You're not going to do a calculation with this, but I want you to take a look at the mountain range 
that astrophysicists and astronomers walk around in all the time. This is um, Kepler's third law in its most general sense. This will work for any binary system. Okay? So Jupiter and its moons, ding, you can use this. Earth and its moon, ding, you can use this. Orion A, or excuse me, Sirius A and Sirius uh, B, ding, you can use this. All right? Now, that factor down the denominator and the factor in the numerator, that's the, that's the constants I was telling you about. Now, one of them is pi. That comes in from all the calculus. The factor G comes in from Newton's law of universal gravitation. Capital G is known as the universal gravitation constant or Newton's constant. And it is a conversion factor in the theory of, in his law of universal gravitation. It's kind of like the conversion factor where you change from Celsius to Fahrenheit and like there's a conversion factor of four fifths and no, five ninths and nine fifths. Okay, and that's, that's one of the conversion factors. Then you got to like subtract 32 or add 32 and all that nonsense, you know. And so the conversion factor there, nine-fifths, five-ninths, uh, is similar to in, in, when Newton developed it, his, his uh, constant G, he developed it as a conversion factor from measurements of mass, um, M1 and M2, uh, and distances to um, a unit of force. All right. And uh, so that was, but we now know that actually G is, has fundamental um, pro, is a fundamental measure um, that controls the curvature of space-time around a black hole, a neutron star, or anything else like that. And I'll be showing you about uh, Newton's constant in the theory of black holes mm, towards the end of the semester. And we'll have a, a formula there. You won't have to calculate with it, but I want you to take a look at it. Uh, question? Yeah, orbital period is the length of time. So you, you click your stopwatch, let it go one rat, one uh, orbit around the sun, and then you click your stopwatch again, and then you convert it to years. Dude, he was German. <laughs> and but you know, we all use K. the t a lot of the intro textbooks use P, but really everybody else uses capital T for period. So, but I don't know what Kepler wrote. He might not have even wrote it in, in algebra like that. But yeah, he was, he was a German. So uh, anyways, so now the, the other factor in the denominator, this, this uh, parentheses, M1 plus M2, the sum of the two masses, that's in a binary system, the mass of one star, the mass of the second star, add them up together, and that's what goes down in those parentheses. All right. Now, if you have a solar system uh, binary system, so the sun and the and the Earth, okay, it's a little bit trickier because the sun is so much heavier than the Earth. All right now, we're going to do that in just a second. All right. So here's our. Our next question, this is from actually from 3.3, Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. How did Kepler miss that factor? You know, M1 plus M2. And how did he not get the factor G and the 4 pi squared? Well, one thing is he, he was correlating numbers. He wasn't developing a causal theory. He didn't know what caused that pattern. He found the pattern. P squared equals A to the third. But he didn't figure out why the forces of nature lock that pattern in place as it does. The forces of nature, gravitation in specific, uh, locks that pattern in place. Kepler didn't, un he didn't, I mean, he didn't have time. I mean, he was doing other stuff. Uh, and Newton was the one that figured out the, the force 
law for universal gravitation, and he figured out these other factors. And we now use these to calculate the mass of stars, black holes, and all kinds of things. Now, what I'm going to show you is why Kepler did not come up with those factors. He, he, he kind of had a, a, a lucky break. Go ahead and write down the mass of the sun and the mass of the earth. The first one is M with a subscript of the symbol of the sun, a circle with a little dot in the middle of it. And then in scientific notation, the mass of the sun is 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Now a kilogram is the mass of a liter of water, 1,000 grams of water, 1,000 cubic centimeters of water. That was one liter. Right? So every time you have a one liter bottle of water, that's about a kilogram, about 2.2 pounds in the English system. But, it, you know, uh, astronomers use metric all the way. So, uh, yeah, the, the, moon, the, the uh, sun, 2 times 10 to 30. Now look at the mass of the, of the earth. The symbol for earth in the second line here is a circle with a plus sign in it. All right, so M subscript earth is equal to the mass is approximately 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. Now they're both really heavy, but look at the exponent. Look at the power of 10. 10 to the 30 for the sun, 10 to the 24 for the earth. So the earth has got um, way fewer kilograms. All right. Now, those are the masses, and we figured those out by using Kepler's uh, second law or third law. Now, here's the ratio, and this is, the, this is what I really want you to um, remember. The ratio of the sun's mass... Hold on a second. Somebody blazing me up. Uh, 230. Uh, let me answer it. My Hold on a second, students. Right, so the mass of the sun is approximately 333,333 333 times bigger than the mass of the earth. So now the reason that that is significant is in, in Kepler's second law, that M1 plus M2, it's mostly going to be the mass of the sun. You know, you can, you know, if, so if you put in 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms for M1, and then... 6 times 10 to the 24 kilograms for uh, mass 2, you know, it's still going to round off to 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. All right, because the Earth is such a small quantity in that sum. It's 333,000 times smaller. So that sum is pretty much just the mass of the sun. So in the solar system, we don't really have to necessarily use... Um, uh, the sum of the, the sun and the, and the earth, or the sum of the sun and all the other planets, any of the other planets, just the sum of the, earth, the, the, just the, the mass of the sun. And when you do that, that constant 4 pi squared on top, and then capital G, and then um, the mass of the sun works out to exactly 1. And that is why... Uh, Kepler's law works 
in the solar system. P squared equals A to the third, and no fancy factors of 4 pi. But now, when you're working outside the solar system, you're looking at a binary star pair. Yep, you've got to deal with it. Okay, question. Okay, so how would the mass of the sun plus the mass of the earth equal the mass? Because it would be like saying, okay, it would be like saying 2.0006 times 10 to the 30 kilograms, all right? Instead of just two times 10 to the 30 kilograms. So if you add the earth in, it goes from two times 10 to the 30 to 2.000006 times 10 to the 30. So you just round it off to two. Okay. Okay. It, you know what it's like? It's like, it, it would be like, uh, It would be like taking a, a big pitcher of coffee, all right, and adding in like two grains of s sugar. Right, do you have sweet coffee now? No, not really. I mean, it's in there, but it doesn't sweeten it up that much. So it's like, I don't like that. Question? I think of it on an exponential scale. And yeah, exponential scale. I mean, it's, it's 10 to the 24 and 10 to the 30, so. So it's basically going to be overwhelmed by... It's like the sun washing out the stars during the day. The stars are still there. You just can't see them because the sun washes them out. And this, the mass of the sun washes out the mass of the earth in Kepler's third law. Now, let's take a look at a famous pair, uh, Sagittarius A star and its companion star S2. Now, this is a false color, black and white, grayscale image of an infrared view of the center of our galaxy. Now, if you look carefully at it, right here in the center of this, there's a little rectangle, okay? Now, we're going to blow up that rectangle, keep the orientation the same, and that's the very center of the galaxy. So here it is. It's, you can see it down here in the very bottom of the screen. All right? Now, right here, where the little plus sign is, that's where astronomers look and try to track uh, SGR A star, Sagittarius A star, the black hole, and S2. And you can actually see S8 and S4, two other companions. Now, look down there at the bottom. You see that little arrow? Actually, it's on the previous one, too. Look at this. Down here, this arrow is 10 seconds of arc. And that's at the center of the uh, galaxy. It's so far away. You know, it's a very small sliver, 10 seconds of arc. By the time, you know, if, if I measure 10 seconds of arc at the door, at the back of the, um, uh, the, the lecture hall here, it might be a millimeter or two. But as far as the center of the galaxy, it's about 0.39 parsecs. A parsec, we'll learn about on Thursday, and you learn about it in the reading tonight, uh, is another, it's like um, a, uh, a distance measurement similar to a light year. Now, here, look at this one. See this arrow down here? This is the blow up. In uh, one second of arc, 46 light days. Now, 46 light days is much bigger than the solar system. Solar system, you're talking light hours to get from the sun like out to Neptune, a few hours. And from Earth, you know, from the sun out to Earth, eight minutes. Okay, minutes and hours for the solar system. Light days is a lot bigger than that. And that's what that, so this is still a pretty big area that we're looking at. All right, so go ahead and mark a note. One second of arc, 46 light days in this false color image. And you can see the north and the east orientation. And that, that's, backward, that's backwards from what we, because you're looking at the sky, you're not looking at, at the earth. That's, that's, that's oriented on the, the north 
and the east of the celestial sphere, not the north and the east of the earth. So it looks a little bit backwards. All right, now here's this famous image where they actually mapped out from 1992 to about 2002 the position of S2. And from this, they were able to calculate the mass of the black hole. Now, we're not going to do that calculation on Thursday. We're going to do a different one involving Sirius, Sirius A and Sirius B, a little bit easier. But yeah, those guys did this with S2 and SGRA star. And the tricky point is, can you measure the semi-major axis? You know, maybe in light seconds or AUs or something like that. All right. And that's what they were able to do. So let's take a look at um, the situation here. Look at that. We got the semi-major axis. Uh, 0 0.119 seconds. All right. Now, my wonderful students, I want you to write that down. The semi-major axis for the star S2, in terms of angular size, um, you know, different aiming points of the telescope, 0 0.119 seconds of arc. That is 119 milliseconds of arc. Remember I told you that last uh, Thursday that, you know, second, you have degrees, minutes, seconds, and even milliseconds. Yeah, 119 milliseconds for this one, for the semi-major axis. You know, they watched it for about, what, nine, for about 10 years. You know, and look, look at what they got. I mean, they got the period, 15.2 years. You know, they watched it for 10 years, and they mapped it out, and they got most of the ellipse, and they said, okay, I think we can, we can estimate now the, the period of this baby. 15.2 years, good, check. All right. Uh, they got the eccentricity, 0 0.87. You know, you can't get, if you only watch it from 1992 to 1996, you can't really get the eccentricity nailed down very precisely. But if you go all the way around the horn, and now in 2002, you're on the way back up. You've done um, ap heal. You know what they call this? Ap astron. And down here, peri astron, meaning star. Away from the star up here, and down here at closest point, peri astron. Um, they, they watched it from before ap astron. In 1992, then they caught Ap Astron up here in 1994, and then it started speeding up. And by 2001, and then down here at about 2002, Perry Astron, and now they went around the horn, and now they're heading back out to Ap Astron. And they said, All right, in 2002, we got it. All right, semi major axis. 119 milli arc seconds. Um, and I'll give you that distance in just a second in uh, light days. Question? Uh, just to clarify, that's the S2 going around. That's the star S2. And the black hole is this circle here with a plus sign in the middle. All right? S2 is the plus signs with the various size error bars. Okay? Now, the semi-major axis, 119 milli arc seconds, my wonderful students, in actual distance, 5.5 light days. All right, now that's way bigger than the solar system. So this thing's out there. It's circling the black hole, but it's way far out. 5.5 light days. It's, it's fairly close. All right, it's not a light year. You know, it's close, way closer than Alpha Centauri, but it's way past the comets and stuff like that. All right? Question. Did you have a question? Who had a question up here? All right, let's keep... What was the thing that's orbiting again? What's that? What is it called again? Like the, the star S2 is the one that's on this ellipse. Okay. Here's its orbital period. Here's its eccentricity. Here's a semi-major axis in arc seconds, and here it is in light days. Now, how big is the black hole? 
you know, what's the event, the event horizon for this black hole? You know how big it is? 37 light seconds. All right, now, 37 light seconds. That's a fraction of the distance from us to the sun. You know, our distance is about 500 light seconds. So this black hole, it's bigger than the sun, but not by a whole lot. All right? And what that tells you is, all right, what's the fate of star S2? You know, everybody always thinks, well, you know, a black hole, everything's going to get, uh, you know, sucked into the black hole, just like in that movie I saw two years ago. And don't go by what movies are. You go by what I say. I know about black, I know, every, well, I don't know everything, about it, but I know plenty. You can orbit, this thing's 5.5 light days away. The, the point of no return, the event horizon, that's only 37 light seconds. There's plenty of room there. The S2 is safe. He's out there. He's happy as a lark. He's, you know, he's, he's sitting back watching Netflix, you know, and sipping on Mountain Dew. All right. Semi-major axis is 13,000 times bigger than the event horizon. Now, if he were twice the size of the event horizon, then you'd want to be worried. But 13,000 times out, that's just another gravitational object, you know. And periastron, that's the closest point of approach, 17,000 times the event horizon, right? Still plenty of distance, even at its close. So he's out there. He's a star. Nothing's happening to him. He's shining, just, you know, cooking He's, he's fusing hydrogen. He's burning hydrogen just like the sun. Putting out a little bit of infrared. We're watching his infrared. But he's not, he's not in danger. Now, that's not to say he's permanently out of danger because he might get, you know, he might get um, budged out of that orbit by some other star that comes near him, and then he might go plunging straight down into the black hole. And that black hole is eating a lot of stars, I guarantee you. So we can use this law of uh, third law of planetary motion for any pair of orbiting objects. Now here's uh, Sirius A and Sirius B. And we've been tracking the position of Sirius B uh, around, and here's Sirius A right here, you know, for many, for over 100 years, I think, we've been tracking it. And we know um, the mass of each of those and on Thursday, um, we are going to actually work on Sirius A and Sirius B and do a real, true uh, Kepler's Third Law calculation. So look at homework. Did you find homework four, my friend with the red hat? All right. Homework four for tonight, a little bit of reading and some YouTube. I'll see you on Thursday. You're dismissed.